So the rules as I understand them are pretty straightforward. You complete a quest or a noteworthy discovery and then you write about how you did it for posterity's sake. So by that logic, if we found Proxy El Dorado, aka the way we recommend everyone makes proxies, then why have we not forensically detailed the process in a step-by-step -step format? Well, we have. You're witnessing it. You're in it. This is the how-to guide to making the ultimate proxy cards. Now get those learning pants on and let's do this. Like any good project that involves making things, you of course need a list of materials before you do anything. Remember from our previous video that our process involves printing on photo paper and laminating said paper. So first things first, we will of course need a printer. What I personally have currently is a couple of Epson inkjet photo printers. One A3 if I want to print 18 cards at a time, or an A4 printer if I want to print 9 at a time. Now not all manufacturers are equal, but generally speaking a printer classified as a photo printer will have the two main things we need, print quality and the ability to feed moderately thick cardstock through its innards. I'd personally only recommend printers with a rear feed, or at least a manual feed that is billed as being able to accept specialty media. There may well be printers that can print thicker cardstock directly from an automatic feed paper tray, but I personally wouldn't be risking it. If you've got a laser printer and you know its capabilities, the same advice applies. But to be clear, I have no experience in using photo paper that's specifically tailored for laser printers, which, as I understand it, is what you'll need to get the best results from lasers. From there we need the paper and the laminating pouches. Here the same advice applies whether you're going A4 or up to A3. Just be aware that there'll be a little bit less choice at A3 for obvious supply based reasons. For the paper you're looking for double sided glossy photo paper. And it's important that you use double sided even if you only choose to print on one side, as the gloss coating being the same on both sides helps provide a uniform feel when you've got the card in hand. You're looking for 180 GSM or 47 pounds paper, and although I've never really been able to find any, you can also work with 200 GSM or 53 pounds paper as I suspect the absolute sweet spot would be somewhere in the middle of those two. Moving to the laminating pouches, you've got a choice of either a gloss or matte finish. My recommendation is based on your needs, so pick up gloss laminate if you know you're going to be sleeving your cards, as it does the least to filter quality and colour production, and your sleeves will then determine the card's reflectivity. But consider a matte laminate if you're not sleeving and you'd rather not have an annoyingly reflective surface when looking at your cards. Just be aware, as I've already alluded to, that there is a minuscule decline in quality and perceived colour production when using a matte finish. As for width, you'll most often find pouches advertised in either microns or mils. For microns, you're looking for those labelled as 75 or 80 or sometimes the same pouch is marketed as 150 or 160 microns. The only difference is that the former is referencing the depth of one sheet and the latter is referencing both. If you got the choice there really is no discernible difference between them, what with it being one one hundredth of a millimetre in difference, so pick one size and stick to it. There doesn't seem to be the same discrepancy in mils, and it's usually just sold as 3 mils, which is basically the same, somewhere in between 150 and 160 microns for both sheets. We also need our laminator. Again, these come in variants that accept A4 and A3 paper. There aren't any prerequisites that you have to look for, and so you'll struggle to pick one that won't do a job for you so long as it looks like it's gone through at least a modicum of quality control. A related recommendation to this is to have a couple of nice hefty A4 books or something similar on hand to help provide a platform in feeding the laminating pouches into the machine so that they stay as straight as possible. The importance of this will come on to later. 
They can also then double up as temporary weighted clamps for your crisply laminated sheets to cool down nice and flat in between. For our penultimate piece of equipment you'll need a suitable paper cutter. Be it a guillotine blade variant or a rotary style bar cutter, you'll decide what's best for you. The most important thing is that the blade is newish and sharp at all times, but it will take a good few cuts before you need to consider replacing the blade. I personally use a rotary cutter but that's just what I've always known. If you are going to be using A3 prints primarily then factor this in when considering the size of the cutter, as most normal sized ones won't be able to cut A3 paper long sides, so you'll have to do a preliminary cut down the middle. There are bigger cutters out there so you decide how much you care about those extra cuts. Finally then, the last item that will be providing the finishing touch is a corner cutter. Once again I'm sure much like the laminator they can all do a job. Just make sure you buy one that has a 3mm or 1 8 of an inch option as that's the closest approximation to most gaming cards. So there you have your shopping list of items. Nothing here breaks the bank other than maybe a printer, but hopefully your current printer was sufficient anyway. Crap, I've just remembered we need a computer. Oh yeah, and photo editing software as well. Preferably Photoshop so you can follow along with what I use, but this ain't a deal breaker. You just need to know your way around your own preferred choice. Okay, so that finally answers the what do we need, but now we need to know the how do we do. So join me please, finally, on this step-by-step -step journey to glorious proxies. Step 1. Obtaining and prepping the images. Now it should go without saying that if you're looking to print proxies, be they your own custom design cards or those already made by others, that you need to collate said images ready for use. I won't delve into this point too much because there are so many different scenarios you may find yourself in, but there are one or two pointers that might not go amiss for this part. Firstly, if you obtained a PDF full of images and they're not really prepared for printing, or you want to pick and choose what images you want, you can usually extract these images from the PDF by opening them as a file just like you would an image, and then import what you need as single images. Secondly, if you're not satisfied with the quality of the images, there are a number of image upscalers out there that use AI technology to improve your source image. Be assured they can't create miracles, but some of them can do wonders with adequate source material. Finally, and this is most relevant if you want to go down the data-driven images route that we covered in our previous video, a method that can really speed up this whole process, especially if you're proxying in bulk, and you might want to rename your files in a logical way so you can identify them just by their number or code name. Okay, so you have your images and you know where they are. It's time to start importing them into your paper sized document. Most software will enable you to open a default canvas the size of the paper you'll be using. If it's anything like Photoshop, it will also default to the preferred 300 pixels per inch or PPI, which is typical for print media. Not that it technically matters for your purposes, but I'll be making reference to the dimensions in pixels, and that will only correlate with what you're doing if you're set up in 300 ppi. Now you have your blank canvas, it's time to start importing your cards. You can of course do this all yourself manually, go to file, place embedded if you're in Photoshop, and place the images uniformly across the page. Alternatively, we have added links to download our templates that even include guides to help you when cutting the cards. These templates also come with the requisite layers you can use to follow the data-driven graphics process I mentioned earlier, which you can follow step by step by watching our previous guide on how to do so. Regardless of how you do it, we tend to make sure all of our card images are 744 pixels in width and 1039 pixels in height. This is the closest you'll get to the most typical size for themed card games, and will equate in the physical world to 63 by 88 millimeters or 2.48 by 3.465 inches. It's at this point we need to touch on whether you're trying to print images on both sides of the card. In other words, are you giving your end product a card back? 
I touched on how difficult this can be in my original video about making proxies due to the fact that most printers will not align the images perfectly on the paper each time it goes to print. Meaning that whether you're manually feeding the paper or trying to duplex print from an automatic tray feeder, you'll still likely see some misalignment from front to back. I do not like the alternatives of folding paper over on itself or just printing two one-sided images and sticking them together, which even if I did consider an option would also mean going back to the drawing board with weights and thickness of card. My less than ideal workaround to this was just to make the card bags comparatively larger, which kind of works quite well, but can still look offset on occasion when looking closely. Suffice to say, there is no foolproof way around this with a consumer grade, reasonably priced printer. You can and should try and feed the paper in fully snug with the guides every time you print though, to minimize this issue. It's also, at least in my testing, not a predictable deviation each time you print. I'd say I even tried inverting the orientation of the backside of the card upside down to see if this resolved the issue. Alas, it did not. For reference then, and if you want to try making the backside larger, I increased the dimension of my card backs to 760 pixels wide and 1055 pixels high, an increase of 16 pixels in width and height. Although you can go as low as 10 if your printer wins at alignment, and up to 20 if it doesn't. You're expecting more misalignment issues from left to right than you are top to bottom, but you also don't want to squash your image too much by making the aspect ratio a lot wider. So let those divergent needs offset and keep your width and height adjustments at a 1 to 1 ratio. A good 10 minutes in advance of laminating your prints, you'll want to turn your laminator on at maximum heat, because there really is no substitute for making sure your laminator is not at the hottest temperature it can muster. So, Consult the rule book if you have to, set the dial to max, and let it do its thing. So to the printing, and apologies if I'm teaching you how to suck eggs at this point, but make sure you've selected the appropriate paper feed in your printer's properties. Set the paper type to photo paper and quality to the highest possible, and press the magic print button. When it's done printing, lie on a flat surface that's absent of any particles or crumbs that can stick to the paper. Then, after letting the ink on your print settle for a couple of minutes, it's time to insert them into the laminating pouch. It should have been a disclaimer at the start of this tutorial, but it's worth noting that you need to try and be as precise as possible throughout this process. Make sure you have a clean work surface and fit your paper in relatively tight and parallel to the binding. Making sure that no notable particles have made their way inside the laminate or are resting on the outside of it. Anything getting in the way of the laminate and the paper binding to each other is going to be an annoyance and a problem, so keep a close eye on what you're doing here. I'm sure at this point I don't need to detail how to feed the pouch into the laminator, but for sure make sure you feed it in so the binding of the pouch goes first. As I alluded to earlier, I find it helpful to have a hefty book act as a tray to feed it in from and to collect it on the other side as well, to ensure the laminate isn't resting while it's still hot in a curved state. And this part is key if you want to minimise the chance of your laminated pouch curving at all. Then clamp it immediately after ins to ensure you've done everything possible to avoid the sheet warping in any way. Before you do that though, I tend to flip the sheet over on the short side and give it one more run through before it gets temporarily nestled between those two heavy books. The heat dissipates very quickly, so if you're in a hurry you don't need to leave it lightly clamped for long before moving on to the penultimate stage, getting your cut on. It's time to make these guards look more like they should do in your mitts. So whether you're using a guard rotary type cutter or a guillotine blade, the process remains the same. You obviously want to be as precise as humanly possible throughout this part, as there are absolutely no takebacks at this point. You also can't guarantee that the lines you need to cut are perfectly perpendicular with the rest stops you abut the paper to. So double check both ends look lined up and meticulously crack on with each cut. 
there's only one piece of advice in terms of optimal cutting strategy and that's that's that you should cut around all four outer edges first and the rest is then personal choice. If you happen to be printing on A3 paper and you only have a paper cutter designed for A4, your first cut will have to be down the middle to make one A3 size into two A4 sizes of paper. But from that point on, the same rules apply. Start with a border and then the rest is however you fancy. At this point then you should have a number of consistently sized, beautiful looking laminated rectangles sitting in front of you and a corner cutter nearby. One last push now. Remember to use the size, assuming your cutter has different sizes, of 3mm or 1 8 of an inch to get closest to the curvature of a conventional card. Again precision is key here, make sure you slot each corner in the groove snug as a rug, give it a good old punch and rinse and repeat your way to a genuinely gratifying end product. And there you have it, the perfect proxy. Give yourself a pat on the back. You just DIY'd the shiznit out of making card game cards. There can be no better feeling than making something from nothing. And here we are. Spread the word. Show your friends. This is the new dawn of proxy making. Any questions or something I didn't make clear enough, pop it in the comments and I'll do my best to respond. For now though, heareth endeth the lesson. My name has been Benji and this video has ended.